All right. Happy Friday, everyone, and welcome back for another episode of Learning Tech Talks, where we are exploring the landscape of learning tech, cutting through the fluff, and getting your questions answered. So today, I am joined by Chris Weeks. Okay, we got a Chris and a Christopher. It is C squared, and uh, it is we are. He is from Rapid Mook, and today we're going to be talking about a lot of things, um, but really focused on what it takes to create production quality video. And they've got a pretty unique solution. So if you saw Rapid Mook and thought, right, you know, some sort of massive open online course platform. It is not that, and I was I was actually fooled by that. So anyway, we will get into that. We will explore all the joys of that. But before we do, uh, and everybody, you know, why don't you let us know where you're joining from? Give us a like while you're at it too. But Chris, where are you in the world today? So I'm in uh, Brighton in the UK, and okay. I'm actually in my uh, my studio set up in my spare bedroom uh, with uh, with sort of COVID regulations. Uh, it's getting harder to go to the London, the the studio in London. So uh, I've actually set this up in my spare bedroom and we're actually partway moving. So what you can't see, you can see the green screen, everything around me. Just, all the you got a way, he's got a way fancier setup than I do. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I've got the studio, but then ev everywhere else in the, in the, uh, in this room is a bit, bit messy. And as I was saying just before, we've got a, I've only got, I'm using a desk lamp for lighting in the front instead of a, all our lights that we usually have. <laughs> yeah. And it's almost beer time, so it's going to start getting darker. So, you know, we, yeah. we might get to see the change. We might get to see the change happen. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm in Waukesha as always. Um, and so now before we get into the conversation around live video or video just in general, question that has nothing to do with learning tech, video, anything. And you've had some time. It took you a little bit to come up with this one. But everybody else play along as well. But Chris, what is your personal celebrity encounter? So this isn't actually celebrity. There's there's multiple of I them. Said, I, I said I, you I, could I, define celebrity however you want. So yeah. you have that flexibility. So when I was a university student, I used to be a, a sound engineer. Uh, so I used okay. to work at a club called the Fez Club in, in, in Reading. Uh, it closed down, actually. But uh, I don't know if that's because of my um, sound or lighting that I was doing. Uh, but on this evening, I was doing lighting, and the band that were doing it were De La Soul. Okay. And every band that you comes in, you have to go speak to them and say, what kind of lighting do you like? How do you want it to be? Like, do you want, like, flashing light? Or is there certain colors that you sort of match your band? So I had to go into this changing room with all the people from De La Soul there. And you're sort of walking around trying to work out, like, okay, and who shall I ask about lighting? And I just say... <laughs> And they're obviously all getting ready for the concert again, getting getting all geared up and getting ready for the for the for the gig. And I just sort of so I just sort of said, "So guys, I need to start lighting. What do you need?" And the guy just one guy just turned back to me, goes, "Nothing bright." And then just and then I was like, "Okay." <laughs> so just like left the room, and I was like, sort of going back to the look at the sound thing and just trying to work out like. So nothing bright. So just dim light for the whole concert was pretty dim much light for the whole concert. Very <laughs> Okay. But um, okay. really good band though. Uh, it's really really great to see them see them live, and uh, and I chatted to them quite a bit afterwards as well um, about okay. their tour and stuff like that. So that's probably my okay. uh, one that I thought of quickly. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, so and you said you were in you did computer computer science, and then you were doing lighting. So you've been in kind of this video space for a while, then. Yeah. So I did a. So I was sort of mainly doing sound engineering and lighting for. Um, it was just a part time job at uni. Um, okay. And I actually got one of my friends who I used to be in a band with. He was like, "Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm leaving this job. Do you want to take it?" So I was like, "Yeah." It was really good fun though because you just got to see loads of really cool bands, and yeah. you just had to do the lights and uh, be sort of sober enough to make sure that it looked good. <laughs> <laughs> that was, kind of, that was my the baseline. Right there. Okay. Yeah. I got it. I got it. Okay. Well, so interestingly, I, there's I, so I actually have met a lot of celebrities, which is weird, but it was all because I used to do a lot of valet in college. I was a valet in college. Mm -hmm. And so I was always at right these places where people went. So I actually met quite a few of them. But the one that I thought was the most interesting, and I'll, I'll stick with this one because it kind of fits with the band theme, sort of. Uh, but so anyway, I was in I was in the Twin Cities in Minnesota, uh, which uh, there was a there was a club there and it was owned by Prince. OK, and so he would come 
on a regular basis. He would come on a regular basis and he was very particular. He was very particular about who drove his car, right? And anyway, I was the regular at this place. So I got to know Prince. I got to know him. I mean, we weren't friends. I'm not going to pretend I'm Jimmy <laughs> Fallon, but I, like, I actually got to know him. And like, sometimes I'd close up the valet stand at the end and he was still hanging out, you know, back and he'd, he'd be like, you want, you want to come in for a drink? You know, you're like, uh, sh sh sure. You don't <laughs> tell Prince. No. Like, what do you say? No, no thanks, man. I've, I got other things to do. So anyway, yeah, I actually got to know, I got to know Prince a little bit back in the uh, day. Yeah, interesting. Very interesting. Amazing. What's that? That must've been amazing. Just <laughs> like getting to drive his car. What was funny, one of the things that was really interesting about valeting and getting to know a lot of like, right. I got to know like basketball stars and you know, all these other things. They're just normal people, right? Like that yeah. was the most interesting thing about them. Now, granted, they all have their very, distinct personalities but it was funny how you know you're like prince is just he's just prince he's quirky he's a quirky guy but he was just you know regular he was actually very down to earth uh anyway mm. we could probably talk about this for way too long but yeah that that is one of my more notor whatever notorious celebrity encounters is, yeah. is prince Okay, so anyway, let's shift gears over to the professional right video stuff. So Rapid Mook, honestly, like I said when we were doing this intro, it threw me for a loop when we first got in touch because I saw Rapid Mook in my head. I'm thinking like, oh, yeah, okay, I know what this is. And then when we met, I remember you telling me more about it and being like, I did not see that coming. I did not see that coming at all. So for folks, right, what is – rapid mook and i think we yeah, can yeah. see it because you got the fancy <laughs> studio right next to you there yeah so we basically sell these uh, studios here that you can see right next to us um <laughs> so what what they are really are is um i guess we can get into the problem i guess of making videos uh, we, yeah. can, we can talk about that in a minute but um what we what we actually sell is all in one green screen restoring uh, recording studio booths for uh either recording uh pre-recorded e-learning content um, so that's making your e-learning content, health and safety videos, training videos. Uh, so any sort of internal communications, marketing uh, video content. Or okay. more and more now as well is allowing people to live stream uh, with professional quality. So as I am doing now, I'm right in front right? of us. Well, you're doing it from a rapid MOOC. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we're streaming live. Um, I've got a lapel mic. We've got lights. Um, we've got a good camera quality. Uh, and we, we've got a green screen behind us and it's all streaming live. But I think the, the really interesting thing uh, I think is, uh, and we, we can talk about this in a minute, but I think it's how do you remove all the barriers to helping people make videos? How do you, how do you get non-technical people? How do you get, um, I don't know, your business leader? How do you get your academic? How do you get people that, they don't know how to do video, they don't know about lighting, they don't know what chroma key means, they don't know what, they might even know what Final Cut Pro or uh, Adobe Premiere is. They don't even know how to use those bits of software as well. So how do you make it really simple, easy uh, for those people to come make content and make them on their own or with a small team? Um, and I think the final piece of that is how do you do it in a scalable way? So how do you get people making 100, 200 videos a month? Um, yeah. And that's sort of when you've got a, a large organization and you've got to roll out uh, like compliance training for... Uh, let's say for finance, uh, and you're gonna have to give that to every staff, and you have to do it every every six to twelve months. The kind of scale of video you need to make for that kind of content to teach online is is pretty big, and also yeah. that content needs to be refreshed. I think that's the other one that the content needs to be ephemeral, um, and I think that's the sort of the key for me around what we try and do at Rapid Move is make it really simple and easy to make lots of videos at are scale. You suggest, are you quality. suggesting? videos in our e-learning from the eighties that we're still using is somehow not acceptable. Is that, is that what you're trying to say? Chris? I just, <laughs> no, it's, it's a really good point, right? I, I think it is. And for a long time, I think a lot of people, I mean, I can say this just from being in the industry and maybe not even just learning, but I think a lot of times people shied away from video because of the fact it just, it was, it was expensive. It was hard, you know? And so there was always this whole, uh, do we really want to do video because, you know, maintaining it, keeping it up to date, it's just, it's not really feasible. And I think that's where, you know, in many ways that's been democratized, but mm -hmm. I think the change is the, the point you brought up earlier, which is now 
things have swung the other way and people make way too many assumptions about video, right? Just because everybody has one of these in their pocket that happens to have a camera or has a webcam, people assume, well, we can do video. Video's easy, right? Yeah, yeah, video, yeah. Video's not easy. I, I, I still yeah. don't think it's easy to do video, at least not to do it well. Yeah, and I think the sort of, I think that the big change in the video that's really changed video, I think, is the distribution channels are there now. We have yeah. LinkedIn, we have YouTube, we've got uh, all these platforms to distribute content. I think the, the challenge now is creating really good, engaging content has become hard. So you kind of have two ends of the scale, I think. You have your, your mobile phone and your iPad. And I think that's great for, in the moment, uh, content or videos of your family or stuff that's quite informal. And it's yeah. kind of, um, and you can, even with a phone, if you've got the right skills, you can make very professional quality videos and you can make it really good. But you need quite a lot of skill involved in that. And then at kind of the other end of the scale, you've got sort of production teams and videographers and you hire a team, they come on site, they do all the work, they spend two weeks editing that video or, and then they produce you a really good video, but that's quite expensive. So yeah. where we try and sit is right in that middle bit where you want you want better than phone quality video. You want to make it really easy for people to do and you want to do it at scale, but you also sort of want that kind of professional feel uh, about the video content and some standards around the, the, the sort of presentation of the content, the, the sort of all the video should look the same. You might want an intro slide to that. You might want an outro slide to that. And just sort of having that really like clear audio, clear video um, and actually just making it. So for example, you, uh, I'll use a, if you give someone a phone and tell them to go make a couple of videos um, and you get like, let's say you get 10 of your employees to go make those videos, some will make them portraits, some will make them landscape, some yep. will, um, some will have good lighting, some will have terrible lighting, some might use a microphone, some might not. And you'll just come back and then you'll try and stitch all these videos together and yes, it's into like a learning journey. And it's like, wait a minute, this is turned to portrait, this is changed to another way, there's seagulls in the background, um, there's noise in this one. <laughs> This and, person decided to shoot the video next to a jet engine, apparently, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, then you might get someone that will just do like a facey video and they're walking along talking about business development and how to do sales. And then you try and pull them together in a coherent uh, sort of educational journey. It's really, it's really hard. Whereas I think what we try and do is, because everyone comes and records in the same studio, making yeah. the same video, same camera, the same layout, actually it makes it really easy and simple to do that. And all your videos look the same. They're all in the right format. Um, and also you can see yourself as you record. So it makes it much easier for them to know if the video looks good because they can, I can see myself on this screen. And if I move over here, I can see myself like, am I in the right framing for this, for this video? Yeah. Um, and you can sort of do all that with the studio. Um, okay. so I think people do really underestimate the, the complexity of making a video. Um, especially I think the planning is the big one. The yeah. people think that you can just, uh, I think most of the work is in sure. the, the, sort of the kind of pre-production uh, rather than post-production. Like you really got to know what content you're creating, get a good script. How is this, how are people going to learn from this? Well, um, hang on though, before we get to that, because I think that's right, talking to kind of the operational nature of it, I think is an important one. But I, I, I just want to reiterate and kind of highlight, I like the way you framed up what Rapid MOOC is. Because when we first talked, that to me was one of the gaps that I'd seen was you had kind of this very scrappy, you know, hey, we, we don't necessarily really care. It's, it's just about catching kind of something raw and, you know, authentic. And if it's not perfect, it's okay because it's really designed to be somebody just sharing something very organically. That we had, right? That, that yeah. now we've done. And granted, I will say there's still challenges with that even getting people to know, hey, how do you get this off your phone and where do you put it, right? There's that. But at least mm. capturing that, there was a fair amount of solutions for that. I think for all of us, even for years, we've known there was the way other end of the spectrum, which was, hey, let's get a full production crew, makeup, lighting, right? We've got a plan for weeks. Let's get this whole thing done. We've got a professional script writer in. You know, it's it's going to take a month to do this thing by the time we we start to finish. You had that end, which right? Where, where people kind of, and, but this middle ground of, okay, we, we need it to be more consistent, more professional. We need it to really have that polish, 
but we don't have budgets to to spend 20 grand on a talking head video what do we yeah. do in between and that really has for a long time in my opinion been a gap and i think that was when you kind of shared with me hey this is something we do i i remember being like that's pretty cool right what a what a cool way to kind of solve for that middle ground yeah yeah definitely and i think the other one is working out um where you want your production value and cost to go as well. So if you're doing a, a slick marketing video or um, a kind of corporate uh, external comp piece, you want that production team and you're going to pay that big money for it. Um, if you're doing a, a LinkedIn live story or a, a sort of Instagram post, the phone works. But when you're like, you want to make some professional training and you kind of want that like really good, clear voice, you want a really good presenter, lighted lit quite well, and they can see their content and they can present their content in a really engaging way. I think that's where we sort of really sit, fit in. And actually making it confident, people feeling confident to make those videos as well, I think is a really important yeah. one. So I always say to our companies and the universities we work with, every time someone comes and make a video, spend half an hour with them, get them making their first video. And then they can <laughs> see how easy and simple it is. They make their first video and they go, oh, okay, and I see how this works. And then, yeah. And sort of after two or three times of doing that, they can come into the studio on their own and make their own videos. They can, they don't need, once you've got, once you've taught them for a half an hour, 20 minutes, they can come make their own videos. And I think it's really interesting because we see it where the people that make really good videos, um, and I mean like the sort of top videos that we see made in our studio, are always the really good presenters, the ones that know their field really well. And basically all we're doing is facilitating the recording and the studio, the studio just enables them to make the video, but the real key to the good video is that the expert who's talking about it and they feel really comfortable talking about their yeah. topic because they, they're the expert and yeah. they're the best video. Well, think, just... right, that, that gets back to that point that you were bringing up before I like stopped you and said, hang on, let me reframe this piece is uh, right. It is. Oh, see, it, we knew that was going to happen. <laughs> yeah. <the> energy right. <laughs> you told me, you said, how many times does this happen? You get the perfect shot and then bam, yeah. the screen saver kicks in. But I think the point that you bring up is sometimes we we assume that the hardware or right is it will solve it right like oh well mm -hmm. we, let's let's get the fancy camera let's get the fancy mic we'll do this and then magically we're going to have great content and yeah it does not <laughs> yeah. it does not work that way I think you were sharing how you know sometimes people will you know will come you you have a studio that you kind of lease out using the equipment too in addition to the actual hardware and you can always tell when you know people come prepared they know what they're doing versus just kind of showing up and saying all right let's make a video and it's not it's not quite that simple yeah and i think really for for us the technology should be in the background the yeah. the, the whole point of the solution is to make it really simple and easy and you shouldn't you shouldn't be worrying about like is the camera set up right are the lights right like, does the microphone work with the camera? Um, like, all those questions that you have when you record a video, uh, if you're doing it on your own without a rapid MOOC, they're really, really challenging questions and they're really hard, um, especially if you're non technical. They, those, yep. those things become really challenging. Um, like, am I positioned in the right place? Um, like, how is the lighting changing throughout the day? And those questions are really challenging, I think, when you're, um, and really all you want to do is create your video. And and, yeah. and I think that's the sort of the key really. And that's where I think the rap move, where we're really trying to sit is hopefully the rap should sit in the background and just make make it really easy for you to create the content. And you shouldn't worry about the technology. Uh, you yeah. should just do the job for you. And then you create all your videos and then you're off. Um, and someone else comes in and makes their videos. Um, I think that's well, the and, of... and it's an important, in, important, I don't know where I'm going with that, <laughs> important point, because it is, right? Technology, especially hardware, I feel like hardware especially can really be a barrier to, mm. to things. You know, I, I even think of some some very basic things like Zoom or, you know, different things. It's amazing how challenging it can be for people you know, I can't tell you how many times where I've been, you know, oh, no, you got to go to the settings. You have the wrong mic. Pick the, <laughs> no, that, that one's not really, can you adjust your camera? I think we have the wrong audio input. Getting an echo. Can you turn, that kind of stuff yeah, yeah. can create an environment where people just go, I don't want to deal with this. This is yeah, yeah. not, this is not a very good experience versus if you can eliminate that and it's like, just show up, be the expert to your point be yeah. the expert, 
and share and don't think about these other things because that's all taken care of. It's just taken care of for you. All you need to do is know how to do it. Yeah, yeah so definitely. That, well, so with that, I kind of want to talk through the workflow of this, right? Because I think we've been talking about conceptually how some of these pieces fit together. But as an example, just because we talked about the fact, not on the show, but last time we talked, we talked about how kind of this workflow works because yes, you're capturing the video, but then to these other points, it's doing more than just, okay, now, now you've got this video, correct? There's more to it than just a, a camera. Yeah, so, there's, um, so, the, so the workflow really is, uh, I might just go to the next, I've actually got some slides. So this is kind of what it looks like just for people um, actually seeing. Um, so I'm actually in front of the studio. Um, my lighting's gone a bit strange now. I know it was going to get darker. <laughs> it's because it's almost beer time. That's why we do. It's fine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, so that's what it kind of looks like. You've got a green screen. You've got all this set up in the studio in front of you. But I think the the interesting bit is um, so the workflow really is at the moment. I've just got my laptop connected. So I just connect my laptop and anything on my laptop is mirrored in the background. So if I just show you like this is actually my desktop. So I can go to the slides. I can show software. Um, I could be on Slack. Uh, anything that's sort of presenting um, on my laptop is in the background, um, and that's sort of how the background all comes into into situation. The next okay. bit you might do is you might get a script. So say you've got a PowerPoint slide like this, and you've written your script in your notes. Uh, you just upload that to the Rapid MOOC, and it will take all the all the notes out of the, each slide, and then create a teleprompter for you. And then, then you're ready if to you record. Have, basically. Like, you don't have to bring your laptop then, technically. If you have, if you've got it on a jump drive or something like that. Yeah, yeah, you can do that, and you can run it on the run it off the studio as well. Um, but yes, yeah, so then you've got your your script, you've got your background, and then basically you just click start record. And I think the interesting one is, um, and I think this is where it makes it really easy for people. If I show uh, this slide, um, you can actually see yourself as you're recording. So I can see myself on this screen. That's why I knew. The sort of Cullen's got a little bit because uh, <laughs> you're sitting here so watching I'm, here going like, why is this blue fuzzy stuff starting to happen? Yeah, so because it's getting darker in here, and uh, I need a bit more light in this room because uh, I've only got two lights, and uh, one of them's a desk lamp. But uh, <laughs> but you can you can see that. So like, I can now just sort of uh, I can just sort of go into the software, and I can see it's a little bit uh, uh, a bit off. So I can actually just uh, I'll do this live. This is gonna be a good test. I can just sort of. Work out where the colors, the, the background just changed a little bit. So we've just got a bit of different lighting okay. now. Uh, so I just changed that. Now and then... you're back to professional polish. Yeah. Look at that. <laughs> uh, so as you can see, like, because I can see that as I'm recording, um, and I can see the, you can see what you're doing as you as you're creating the content. It makes you get that instant feedback. So one, it makes you a better presenter because you can you can see how you're presenting, and the other one is you know what it's going to look like. So once you've recorded your video. Once you stop recording, you get an MP4 file, and then we take the script and turn it into a VTT file, and that's ready okay, to go. Okay, so it's even doing the subtitles. Yeah, yeah. And then you've got the subtitles built into your video, and that's ready to upload to um, YouTube, Vimeo, uh, Panopto, Kaltura, whichever your, okay. your flavor of LMSs. <laughs> um, <laughs> whatever, whatever you want. Okay, so I guess yeah. I didn't realize that either. So there's some, there's some software kind of power behind it too that's actually because yeah. again if you're doing the transcription you've got some sort of ai tool built into it that is auto transcribing what's being said and creating the file that then can be used so we, to so we, take the, we take the script we take the script and just timestamp it through the video as it as the teleprompter rolls okay got it got it interesting okay that's how it's working all right yeah. okay but that's, but that's, where, that's where the sort of workflow is very different from um a kind of I guess your your standard recording because usually what you're going to do is you're going to come, let's say you've got a digital SLR camera and a green screen studio set up. You need to get your tripod, put your camera in the right place, work out the angle, set up all your lights. Then you need to make sure you need two people, by the way, for that because you need someone to someone to stand in the position and someone to be filming to make sure you're in the right position. <laughs> right, um, somebody's got to stand there to make sure that it's how you want it because you're not seeing it. Yes, yeah, so then, and then you record, and then usually you have a separate teleprompter with that as well. And then you record all your video, and, but you won't be able to see your background either. So you record all your video, and then you will, um, then you'll take it off the camera, put it into a laptop, encode all the green screen encoding uh, on in Final Cut Pro, 
then you'll need to embed the subtitles or create a separate subtitles file from the teleprompter that you had. Or you can do it with Microsoft Stream or YouTube now. It's better getting better. Um, and then, then you send it back to the person to make sure the video looks good. Because they're obviously standing in front of just a green screen. And yeah. they weren't seeing themselves as they're recording. So they don't know if they were standing in front of their content, whether they're standing. Because you've had to. So you might get all the way to the end of this thing and then go, <laughs> oops, we got to redo yeah. it. Um, okay. Whereas this way, you can you can watch the video back straight as soon as you record. You can watch it back, which is um, really good. And we actually have clients use us just for PR training, so they use it as a way of improving their really? presenting skills and getting better at presenting because they've got a teleprompter, they can see themselves. They're going to go onto the news or some website, like some live event that they're going to have to read a teleprompter and they want to present really well. They'll come into the studio, use the space practice right. what they're going to say in front of the studio and not even record a video, um, yeah. but just do it with the presenting and the feedback and all the sort of okay. extra that you get. Well, because you can do it in real time, right? I mean, I, th yeah. I guess that's the big piece is you can actually see. Well, and, and that's, I, I'd love to kind of dig into some of these use cases, but hopefully, right, for people who are watching who maybe haven't done a lot with video, <laughs> it's, it's not as simple as I think a lot of times. I mean, I can't tell you how many conversations I've I've been in over the years where people have said, let's just put together a really nice video. And you don't realize the time and the effort and right the amount of things that you have to do to get that right. And I think that is where, you know, a lot of times that's taken for granted because we just assume that, well, this this happens. I know how to shoot a video with my phone. And it's like, uh, that is not yeah. the same thing as you know some of this other stuff that we're talking about, and even some so of the we're, we're, it's like just just on that. I think some of the some of the clients we talk to, some some our sales process is quite quite slow for for it takes sometimes some of our clients six to twelve months to sort of go through the decision process to purchase the studio. But sometimes I've talked to people and they've they've, they've set up the whole they've set up the whole studio. They've done everything. They have digital house camera. They've done. Uh, they've set up the green screen. They've got this whole studio and they've, they've bought yeah. all this equipment and no one's using it because <laughs> it's too hard to use it. Um, yeah. and, and they've got this, this whole space and unless you, and, or occasionally people are using it cause they've got experts and they've got like video people on site and they're like, yeah, they're doing all the work to help, uh, the sort of experts record their content. But sometimes they've got this whole space set up and, and it's just not getting used because it's just complicated. And mic connect to cameras, and then uh, things go missing, and then lights break, and there's just lots of sort of components that can um, be quite challenging. I think. Well, and I think, and maybe that's why for me personally, when we when we first met, I was like, "This is because if you've been in the space, if you've done it, you know, you know these challenges, these things that that just cause this kind of concept to just fall apart." And I remember mm -hmm. I was with one org. I was with one org and we had, we had a studio in, in right. The organization, it was in the building. It was a full blown studio, but it was staffed. It was staffed with a video team. And so people got very comfortable with this idea of, Oh yeah, we need to shoot a video. You just go downstairs, you know, schedule it and it gets done and, and the magic happens. And so people took that for granted. And yeah. then at one point, somebody got this brilliant idea of being like, well, you know what? People just go and do it. We probably don't need to staff it. We'll just let people use the stuff and, and just go in and yeah. use it. That's what happened. Just like you described, like it was dead. Nobody used it because they would go in and go, I don't, what do I have to, I, how do I set this thing up or what do I have yeah. to do with it? And literally the whole studio just, it ended up getting gutted and we didn't use it anymore because well, we didn't have the expertise to do it. And I think that was what was interesting about this is the fact that you kind of are packaging that video team expertise, not completely, like we said, if you need to do a full-blown high-end thing over here, that's different. But that kind of middle ground of we need some sort of studio production without all the added expense, I think is where, yeah. again, it goes back to that's where it plays very nicely. Yeah, and especially when you're uh, sort of when you're looking at volume as well, and sort of trying to get sort of employees or experts to make the content. So yeah. a lot of our clients just have a booking system. They set up a studio and they just okay. give it out to all their employees, and it's like book it for half a day. They come in, they make their own videos, then 
they take their videos away and the studio just sits there like a facility for large corporates or universities and they just people just book in sessions and they do it on their own they don't you can actually um like you can record videos all completely on your own you don't need anyone else in the room um and i think that's quite an interesting angle as well when you've got people that, yeah, that's what i was going to ask from a use case standpoint how are yeah. people how are people doing this you know are they so they're bringing it in they're they're getting one of these studios setting it up somewhere that it's consistent and then that's kind of it's not necessarily just a piece of learning hardware i mean it could be but really it's a piece of hardware that's then available to the organization for whatever they need it for yeah so, so pretty much most people start with learning and development i think they're the main uh, yeah it's usually the most uh so a lot of our clients start with it because they've got some courses they need to convert online they need uh, some big content they need to sort of share out but then usually the marketing department hear about it and then we I start was say, I, I have to imagine marketing catches wind of it and is like hang yeah. on a second you guys have this little mini studio that's available yeah yeah and you and you can make all these sort of cool sort of 30 second one minute videos on it and then usually you end up with a sort of compliance team maybe uh, health and safety uh, uh, training videos, and then internal comms is the next probably big one. So okay. CEO updates um, or CEO streaming into uh, a session, a meeting they can't attend. So it might be like an all hands meeting and they're in a different office space that's got a rapid MOOC. So they'll do this, they'll stream in, uh, they'll get okay. the microphone, make it look really nice, have their building behind them or some uh, nicely branded slide behind them and they'll present to uh, sort of another office space or uh, another area. So that's kind of another big one. Um, the other probably main one is knowledge retention and knowledge management. So okay. um, let's say you've got an aging workforce and you've got this expertise that you need to somehow distill. Uh, how do you do that? Uh, and how do you start to do that as well? And then a big one, um, which is becoming more and more for us now is, so this is all kind of like pre-recorded content. So that, yeah. the second part of our, that you can do with the studio is exactly like this, the live streaming stuff. And this is uh, typically because of COVID, um, this is becoming a much, much bigger market for us now. The Zoom rooms, virtual classrooms, the blended learning spaces that your people are creating where you've got some people physically, and a lot of people remote, um, setting up a studio to do that kind of blended learning, online learning, Zoom rooms, virtual classroom, all that kind of stuff is becoming really important at the moment. Um, okay. And, um, and getting these sort of streams working really smoothly because recording videos is one thing, setting up streams with a digital SLR camera, microphones is yeah. uh, another completely different challenge. And then using, uh, connecting it to your laptop um, is, 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 is okay. And some people do like, a lot of this training in that space is very much the laptops are the streaming tools. Yeah. Um, so a lot of learning has become a laptop, but one thing you can't read on a laptop is you can't really like, so I can get up and I can move around and I can sort of I can yeah. get my full body. I can get a full body experience um, on the studio. Um, and actually but the laptop works if you're just, if you're stationary, right? If you're just yeah, going to yeah. sit there and be, you know, again, not doing anything, but looking at what's on your screen and do that. But going back to your point, if you're doing a classroom, if you're doing, um, I even think, right. I've, I've seen a lot more in the virtual event space, Right. Mm. When people are doing virtual events where, to your point, it's kind of this mix, this hybrid where yeah. there are some people that are there. They're physically there. They're kind of interacting, but they also may have a guest, you know, on screen. Their audience may yeah. be virtual. And it's one of those. How do you capture that? How do you capture that? Because you can't you can't just set your laptop on a table and, yeah, yeah. you know, just try and turn it and ship it just it doesn't work and it's definitely they're not designed for that either a laptop is not designed to capture that kind of experience yeah i think actually that leads me onto my next pictures maybe yeah this one <laughs> leads, leads nicely into my next picture um but <laughs> yeah this kind of... <laughs> um, okay, so that's yeah, the mini one so even the mini one then has a screen on it that give, allows yeah. you to do all the things you talked about where you can kind of see what's going on and capture all that yeah, and like setting it up like this, where you've got a sort of classroom and you've got a presenter and you're sort of half the classroom's there, half the classroom's not. This is this is very popular um, remote training. Um, and these look, the little ones look really cool, I think. We've, because uh, uh, I've got, this is the one I've got in my house and they look like a little army, I think. I, I, I really like the, the I'm Wait, you have that many in your house? 
<laughs> no, I've got that many in my house, but they. Okay, they I was going like to say you've got an army of these things in your house. Good grief! No, okay, I got, I got one, but uh, but they uh, they look. They've got a. It's quite. Uh, it's quite funny because they you, you sort of get a bit emotionally attached to them in a weird way because I've kind of got this smiley face and like a little, right. It looks like a little robot. It's taking me yeah. to you know some of the animated movies that I watch with my kids. You know where it looks like a little, little you know creature. <laughs> yeah, but. It, but it's also um it is also a sort of design choice um because you can't really see the camera and you okay. it does look quite fun and it means when you record if you're quite anxious about recording or worried about it um just not seeing this huge camera and loads of people can actually really relieve the stress and it's suddenly it's like yeah. oh, it's quite fun it's interesting this is like exciting it's like it feels good to make these videos it's not like a oh my god i've got to make 20 knowledge management videos uh that this this weekend or something it's sort of it's quite like yeah. it just makes it much more fun and engaging well, i think as well. what's funny about it i think and again kind of comparing it to something that you when you look at you know i think of i have a bunch of kids right so children's science museums are something i'm familiar with and there's always that newscaster place yeah, yeah. in this children's science museum where again you're not walking into a studio where there's cameras all over whatever you know it's, it's not overwhelming and intimidating but all of a sudden you see yourself on screen and it's a green screen and you kind of are, you see people just kind of gravitate to it. And it brings, it brings down that anxiety level because now it's, it's not scary. It's not intimidating. It's, it's kind of fun, right? You're having some yeah. fun with this technology and you get to feel like, you know, you're on TV or whatever you want to, yeah, whatever yeah. you want to do, a different experience. So yes, I do that really, really intentionally design that way to make it feel less intimidating yeah yeah and also um i don't know do you guys have a get me out of the jungle do you have that show in america i don't know what the version is you must it must be like survivor or something okay but, uh, yeah people probably love, something like that survivor okay yeah so people love um so we do when we do the, the the recording sessions people love making fun videos at the end they just like oh let's do let's pretend we're in a jungle and then we're going to make a funny video and then they take them back to their company and they're, they're used in internal comms to make to show what they can do with rapid mooc and we recommend customers when they purchase a studio like make some interesting videos to share around to the like the rest of uh the rest of the company to help people understand it's like it's quite easy and fun to make video and it's yeah. quite exciting as, as well at the same time as um because quite often some people they've got sort of when clients first get a studio they've got maybe sometimes up to like nine twelve months backlog of content okay needs updating so usually when they first get a studio there's just it's just like, how are we gonna get all these videos made and they're sort of really sort of pushing so on is that usually get a catalyst right that makes people kind of say hey we, we should consider something like this where you know whether it's covid or some other thing where they say we have a whole bunch of content that needs updating and we need to do it quickly rapidly right we need to do this very quickly and be able to generate some quality content but we can't have it take months and months and months to create one thing. Yeah. So is that usually the catalyst that makes people go, Hey, this is a solution that may help us kind of churn through this backlog. Yes. Quite often there's usually, usually what we find is there's usually got one sort of major learning project or something that's going on or okay. development project or knowledge management project. Um, and they start to look at a lot of different solutions. So like, Oh, can we just pay a company to record this? Can we um, get our own staff to record the content themselves? And quite often they sort of find you start to get into this sort of weird area where it's actually really hard to like, you're either gonna have to set up a whole studio with green screen, do it all yourself, DIY, and then you have to hire someone to manage that studio, or they're gonna pay lots of money for external people. And then we sort of fit in that sort of really good area where it's like, actually you can buy a studio, we'll teach you how to use it, we'll set it up for you, and then you can sort of get your own people making that content you want, really. yeah um i think that's usually the driver when there's sort of a learning project or uh, the other big driver at the moment is virtual classrooms just okay um companies and organizations where they have to do face-to-face -face or they have to do some sort of training for compliance or uh like a university is a great example they've got to be teaching remotely and they need to be doing that um, consistently. And they don't have the capability or the resources to upskill all of their faculty to know how to create and run a studio. I mean, that's yeah, yeah just not feasible. 
And also, if you think even just um, you've only got to go on a few Zoom calls to realize that people even struggle with their laptops. You get half the face. You've got like someone's you're looking up someone's nose. You've got like someone's <laughs> iPad pulled over. It's sort of like and that's just that's, that's just streaming from your laptop with uh, a, a, even if you've got a good ca a laptop and a camera. That's there's sort of challenges that you've got to really think about when you're trying to create video content. You've got to remove all those barriers and be really detailed about all the challenges well, that people are going to talked about before, right? The goal is to remove those barriers so that yeah. your subject matter experts or your facility, right? So that they can focus on what they're really there to do, which is, you know, take what they know, take their expertise and actually share that and facilitate dialogue, conversation, things like that versus trying to figure out why, why their audio is breaking up or why they can't, you know, their laptop fell over. They can't get their slides to share things like that. Yeah, yeah. And that's before you get into sort of the more advanced things you can do with a studio, like you can merge videos, do picture in picture and lots of other features, um, augmented reality now. So if you want content in front of you rather than behind you, uh, we can do that on the studio. Um, there's lots of things like that, which are much more, uh, much, much more advanced, which people eventually get to. Um, but most people it's that kind of, how do we get that really nice, um, good content? And I think the other one is, um, and I sort of talk to a lot of companies around this is how do you present your content? Because I think that there's been a bit of a sort of, I think e-learning and video has, has sort of been put into fast forward, uh, to put it lightly uh, at the moment. Just a little bit. <laughs> just a little, a little bit. bit. I would say 2020 maybe accelerated it ever <laughs> so slightly. But um, I think the the interesting thing is that people... What you don't want to do is just replicate offline online, if that makes sense. You don't want to just I go know exactly what you're talking, right? You don't want to just take what you did and then just shove it into a digital yeah. box because it's just not going to work. So online videos are shorter; they're sort of free to maybe ten minutes long. They need to be broken down into small sections. They need one video, one point. Um, they need to be sort of really engaging. And I think so with the sort of current fast forward of e-learning and this sort of space, I think. At the moment, what we've done is gone, okay, we just need to get everything online. And then I think now we're starting to think about actually yeah. how do we make what we're doing online really engaging, fun, interesting, exciting? How do we make sure the learners are developing the right skills throughout the process that we're doing? And how are we making this content actually really good rather than just we need to get it all online? It's like yeah. how do we get it on? Now I think people are thinking like how do we make all this content we've got online really good? We spoke. How can we update it? How can we evolve it? Um, and I think that's uh, another bit that we, I really think is really interesting, the kind of ephemeralness of content. So yeah. you can try and make a video on Rapid MOOC and you can make 10 videos. And then in three months' time, if you don't like those videos, it's so easy to come make another three Yeah. record. Yeah. And you don't well, have to get I a team that's... inside. You don't right. have to like. Right. And, that, and again, I think we talked about this earlier is the fact that that has in the past been an inhibitor for maximizing yeah. video is the fact that it felt like, we spent 20 grand and three months making this four minute video. We can't do that all the time and we can't remake it. So there's almost this effort to make it perfect versus saying, let's just do it. Let's do it. We'll, we'll learn from it. We'll see if it worked. We might need to iterate, but if we need to iterate and redo it, it's no big deal. We'll just we'll, we'll toss it and then we'll move on. And I think that's a bit of a mindset shift that I think the technology can enable, right? Because yeah. now it's coming much more feasible and scalable to say, hey, we don't need to design content with a 10 year shelf life. We can design yeah. content with a three, six, nine month shelf life, because if it's irrelevant, we just get rid of it and right, we'll, we'll create something new. And unlike, you know, with actual, physical things, we're not going to end up with a landfill of garbage. It's just like, you, you just delete it. It's gone. We yeah. don't need to worry about it anymore. We move on. Yeah. So with that, the, oh, go for it. I was just gonna say with that as well is like some content only gets used once. So we, we work with a lot of utilities and, um, okay. we work with a couple of, uh, nuclear power plants and they do, uh, safety briefings before they shut down the plant and they make okay. one video for that. And they do a, brief, a video brief. That video gets used once that time, and that's it. They send it out to all their staff, and then <laughs> that video just gets deleted. But or another one is with student feedback. So you might have a university, and they want to give 
coursework feedback on this terms module. They can just create a video, take two, three minutes, send it out to all their students. And that's their feed, like customized feedback for those students. And that video only gets used once and then it gets deleted after that because that's the sort of quick and simpleness of creating that content. Yeah. Well, and so, you know, it is, I, again, I think the use cases are, you know, it, once you start, once you start thinking about it, especially if you've done things with video in the past, right. As you start thinking about it, I'm not surprised that organizations that, you know, engage with this kind of hardware, that it does almost create this viral effect where, one group gets it, they're using it for a very specific purpose, then they start using it for other purposes, people hear about it, then they start using it for it, like pretty soon, you've got people just wondering, you know, hey, how do we, how do we, you know, we're, we're using this thing too much, right? We, the thing's booked all the time. And, but unlike having to build a full blown studio again, you can be like, well, just get another one and put it in another cool. room, because that's all we need to do. We don't need to build an entire sound studio all over again. So, but with COVID, yeah. I am curious on this because I, I thought about this when I knew our episode was coming up because, right, sometimes going back to that point of sometimes we're so focused on like what we know or the use cases that we think, what was the impact or, you know, how have you kind of even evolved your messaging a bit? Because I could see when COVID hit, I'm sure some people could easily have been like, Oh, well, people aren't coming into the office as much anymore. So, right, the, the use cases have evaporated when really, to your point, whether it's live streaming, whether it's these blended mixes, whether it's right different use cases, to me, it just only opened up more opportunities. But I have to imagine there was kind of a, a shift that you had to work through with 2020. Yeah, it's definitely, it's been, it's been super interesting, I think. Um, I think the shift to online and streaming has been a big one for us. The shift from okay. real time uh, content um, has been a big one. I think the shift from, so mainly most of our studios, like our pro studios, our big ones, are set up in offices. So we're in office okay. locations. And um, in the UK at the moment, like no, pretty much everyone's been told to work from home. Yeah. So the actual studios in the office location for a lot of people don't have access. But the interesting thing is, because you can use the studio on your own, um, and you don't need anyone else in the room. A lot of companies now are starting to open up their studios just for re recording content, and they're just letting people go in one day, then okay. sanitizing the whole studio, and then the next day someone's coming in. So it's really interesting to see how companies are evolving, but they're opening up not their office, but just the rapid move space. So they can create really? A it's like, yeah, well, the office is still closed, but we're opening the studio so that people can come create this stuff because we need it, right? We still need it yeah. as an organization to get messages out there to do some of these different things and so they're opening just the studio yeah so i think that's a really interesting one i think the other one where we're seeing more now especially with the smaller the smaller go um it's kind of like what i'm doing now set up home studios like with if your if your job's a trainer and most of your content is actually i need to create e-learning content i need to train people on how to do certain things actually having a studio at home, like set yeah. up in your study, set up a green screen, stream all your training live if you want to do live training, or record all your content and start recording your content at home. Um, so that's sort of an area we're seeing start to open a little bit. Um, and I think the other one is the blended classroom, the sort of idea of this half classroom, half um, half virtual, um, I think is, is really interesting. But I think the, yeah, so the sort of, the streaming has really grown. The like live sessions and the more sort of working at home is definitely an area, really interesting area at the moment. And then I think for the kind of the pros, I think it's about how does it fit into a, a corporate company at the moment? I think it's changed a little bit because obviously before you'd set up in an office location and all your people worked in that location. Yeah, you know, that, was, that was pretty obvious, right? Like yeah. the, this pro was pretty straightforward where, hey, everybody's here. This is kind of where we put it. But now we're seeing where it's like, well, everybody might not be here. And in some companies yeah. may never be coming back. Yeah. So it's actually become more now, like how do companies open those spaces up? And, um, and I think actually I see it more. So the, I think the transition, the office is changing slightly, but office spaces are going to become more collaborative, more like you're gonna have to go there for a reason. Um, yeah. And I see rapid move being part of that reason. So actually, 
um, you've got your, um, let's say you've got some uh, expert in neuroscience who works for a biotech company. And actually he needs to talk about his results and he needs to share it with everyone in the company and the sales team. So he could do that through a, his laptop, but he could actually just come to a Rapmook studio, create a really good professional quality video or stream it while recording at the same time. So everyone can get a live session, but we yeah. record it at the same time and then you can upload it. And I think sort of as office space has become more collaborative, um, sort of we really envision more studios being set up by companies. I think the other one is just the demand now is that sort of, I for ages said that every online, every physical course needs a digital version. Yeah. Um, and I've been like saying that for like two and a half years and people are like, yeah, I guess so. But like face to face works really well for us and really like the in person and like, and don't get me wrong. Like I, I still think there's a huge place for face to face training. Um, I just think it should all be recorded. If you know what I mean? If you're doing any face to face training session, it should be recorded or streamed live. So then you've got access to the whole sort of the whole market or the whole, uh, the whole of the organization that you're in. Um, and I think that's going to be the, the, I think that's hopefully will be the main transition now is that okay. even if you do design an online, uh, a face-to-face -face course or an in-person course, once you can now do make them, a digital version of it much easier. Yeah. And you will, and everyone will make a digital version because whether it's COVID or the next pandemic or the other, the next thing, I think we've got to, we've now come to that point where we realized that actually it was a risk not having all this content virtual. It was. It was well, and that, it was, that was the risk. That, that was the risk we realized in 2020 was what happens when we can't do it, right? Yeah, what yeah. happens? To me, the thing you know, the thing that you bring up, and I think this is a really, I, I very much share your pers people think because I'm the digital guy, I hate anything in person, and I'm like, it, that's not the case, right? That's not the case. But there has to be a purpose behind it, and you need to think about it in terms of what about the people who can't be there because a lot of times we make this assumption that it's like well everybody can well guess what everybody can't and that's been mm. that way for a very long time whether it was distributed workforces whether it was health issues whether it was right whatever there's always a million reasons where it's like well what happens when somebody can't be there they should still have the same access and that's mm. what digital opens up is it's not saying let's nix everything that we've done, but instead let's make it, let's create greater accessibility by using technology to do that. And to be fair, it was a lot harder before, right? I mean, I mm. look at the, the, you know, rapid move go versus if you tried to tell a facilitator or an organization that did training that every time they did a session, they needed to bring in a whole production studio. It never happened. Not even yeah. just cost wise. Cause you'd be like, that is going to disrupt the class, it's going to disrupt everything we're doing. Like, how on earth are we supposed to do that feasibly? And so then it became, well, this, and this is why people didn't do it because then it was yeah. an added task. It's like, well, if we're going to create a digital version, that means we have to go through all this additional work versus if it's like, hey, we made it easy because the technology is just there. You don't really yeah. need to be doing a lot with it. I think to your point, the ability to create an equal experience. And, and now the one thing I will caution people of, and I think you would probably agree with this, is that you do have to be careful that you're not like, oh yeah, our digital version is this just camera sitting somewhere capturing nine yeah, yeah. hours, of what everybody else is doing. And then we go there, hey, here's the digital version. Nobody's gonna, nobody's gonna participate in that. Yeah, I think that kind of, if you're streaming that version and it's on a live broadcast, I think just streaming the session live is good. But I think you really like you. I, I totally agree with that. I think you're, if you're just taking like a, a one hour, two hour talk and going, I'm just going to record that and then put it onto a platform and that's going to be it. I think it's just, I just don't think the way people learn online isn't like that now. I think the, yeah. the sort of small bite sized pieces that people can drop in and out of, they can, sort of do those small chunks is the sort of really way people learn online right now. And all, yeah. also filling in all the different breaks and stuff. So are you asking questions after certain videos? Are you prompting people? Are you doing all the extra learning design stuff that isn't just a video? Because there is the video yeah. side of it, which we, we, we help create, but there is a sort of learning design piece that's uh, slightly separate, I think, as well. I agree. And I think that's where going back to, and this is what we saw. <laughs> 
I'm this not. is what we saw with um, this was the issue we saw when right everything with COVID hit right was the fact yeah. that all of a sudden we had to go online we weren't really prepared for it. many of us weren't and now we had to move things digital so we just kind of scrambled it together and, and popped it into a digital format now we need to go back and say okay that we can't leave it at that like that is yeah. not an acceptable piece and that's where you know the idea of hey how do we how do we do this well how do we architect this experience how do we think differently about it knowing that we have to design seamlessly it has to feel like an experience whether it's in person whether it's virtual whatever we're doing what are the ways that we can do this and i think you know being able to make it easier for people is huge the last thing i we're, we're, i told you we were going to run out of time <laughs> but i am curious i am curious with this because you know you brought up before we went live this aspect of the fact that you you showcase some of these things at devlearn and you were surprised in the us kind of the reaction to whoa whoa i'm on camera this is this is weird or this is different and i and i think I will say, you know, globally, even I, I still see this where that can be an uncomfortable territory for people, right? To all of a sudden you're recording yourself. How do you do that? How have you seen organizations kind of overcome that challenge and say, hey, look, it is what it is. Just get, get you'll get used to it. You know, what does that process look like for people? I think, um, I think there's some people that won't go on camera. I think there's certain privacy around being on video that people find very hard and challenging, I think. And I think that's, I think organizations should understand that. I think for me, what I think the interesting question is, when you've got someone that really understands their topic and they're really experts, highlighting to them that actually this video can be really useful to lots of people. And this content you create is really exciting for lots of people to learn. And then I think the next stage from that is sort of, really helping them make that first couple of videos right. like the first video you make is really hard i think i think people i can i even see it when people first start using our studios they get quite anxious they are like oh i'm gonna record they might sort of they might be worrying about it they've even been worrying about it before they even come to the studio <laughs> and actually that's where like and you can even see the first take people do um, when they record a video it's always a not a very good take we never we never keep the first take because they you can just tell they if, another one is they don't realize they can move their arms. So when when people re <laughs> usually record, because because when you see yourself, you stand very robotic, you stand like this, and then eventually you move your arm and you go, oh actually I can and I can see my arm while I'm moving it, uh, and then they sort of move the other arm. They go, oh that one moves as well, um, and <laughs> it's, so it's really strange. But like after a couple of videos, people really sort of loosen up, and then the thing I find really interesting is when you've finished a recording session with someone. Usually afterwards, they they feel quite relieved they've done it, but they also also really have enjoyed it. And then they start going, when can we come make, oh, I need to make these videos, I need to do this. Oh, and we also need to do this. And by the way, we need to get so-and-so in here to come make this video as well. And actually, I think that's the that's the bit I really like is when you these people suddenly, you, they can see that the, the, it's clicked and you can see they've really enjoyed it, they've really had fun, they've really liked how the videos look. It wasn't stressful for them. Um, they had the prompter, they had the, they could see themselves. They're really happy with how it looks because they've obviously seen themselves as they've been recording it. And then they're sort of starting to see all these other things they could be doing and how they can scale up and digitalize a lot of the other work that they would have been doing before. Um, especially some people that do face-to-face -face training and they do, they might do uh, sort of four or five face-to-face -face training sessions a week, maybe more than that, sometimes 10. Uh, and they're traveling all around the country and then suddenly they go, wait a minute, I could just make a video for all these different video things. And I can spend all my time focusing on the content creation. And then right. I can do folk face-to-face training, or I can do one-to-one -one sessions with people that need more help. I think yeah. that's a really interesting one as well, when you what the video allows you to scale your it training. People up, right. It frees yeah. and, and again, I think that's it. It frees us up when you start thinking about it this way to focus on what I call the higher order tasks, right? The things yeah. where we're actually driving retention and reinforcement and how are we actually doing we're, we're improving the design the things that we a lot of times don't have time for because we're so busy with this other stuff that it's like well we'll get to that later right which is exactly what yeah. happened in 2020 oh we'll get to that later well 2020 came and oops 
we maybe should have been ready for it. So, yeah, yeah. well, this, this has been, honestly, this has been awesome. I, I've really enjoyed the conversation. I think, you know, the thing we hit on at the end there that I think when you think about this for learning professionals, one thing, you know, that we can think about with this is, you know, we talk about the need to improve communication skills in people, right? That's a skill gap. To me, I yeah. see applications for this for how can we improve things? Well, you improve through practice. And this is actually a pretty interesting way. That's one of the things I get excited about with video is the fact that you can get people to practice their communication skills and see it and learn from it and see like, okay, I, I need to get better at this, or I would do this, or this is how I would change so I can become a better communicator. So I think there's some pretty cool stuff and it, it was pretty cool. I'm glad we were able to make it work from the actual yeah. device. It's been cool, cool to see it kind of come to life and hear more about the journey over the last year. So I appreciate you being here and uh, taking the time. No, thank you very much for having me on. It's been, uh, this is my first LinkedIn Live, so I've, I've really it's enjoyed it. First it's LinkedIn great. Live. See, there you go. See, and you weren't even that nervous. So good for you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, awesome. apart, from, apart from the light getting slightly worse in this room. Yeah, uh, apart, and, uh, apart from the light. Ah, oh, well, you know, whatever. Yeah. Well, I will let you get back to it. Um, thanks, everybody, for watching. Thanks for tuning in. Hopefully, this made you think a little bit differently about the way you're approaching video in your strategy. And I will be back. Next week, we've got a double header. So I look forward to seeing you then. Uh, keep an eye out on where we're going from there. So have a great weekend and we'll talk later.